I'm going to go off the drugs and I'm going to see what my baseline is. How crazy am I without, without drugs and without foods that could affect my mental state? And this really cool thing happened. Um, I ate raw vegan. It only took about six months before I started just not having a problem anymore with my mental health. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. So, Dotsie, uh, it's been a little bit since we checked in with how your wine is doing. We talked in <laughs> front of Marcus Borges' um, episode. You said you were going to start. Um, a 22 days of not drinking wine in the evening because it really wasn't adding to your life. Right. Yes. Well, so I think in, in that uh, little intro to that episode, I had talked about that. I knew I was very aware that I had kind of like this sort of hand to mouth addiction. That's why I smoked for 14 years in, in addition to probably like in the nicotine. But um, so I've definitely identified that that is a part of it. So I am currently, um, keeping, uh, LaCroix, the sparkling water company in business. Um, you're welcome. LaCroix, uh, if they want to sponsor the podcast, uh, that is what I put in the wine, in a wine glass. Like I love the weight of it. I like how it, it feels. I like the movement of, in my wrist and, and the light and it's, it's, it's trippy, but I have recognized that because I do not want a LaCroix in like my water glass. I want it in the wine glass. So just, that's just kind of, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of wild human psychology, right? Like what you're trying to unravel what I'm truly attracted to about the whole entire journey of drinking wine and not just what's in the glass. So I recognize that. So I have, a, have had a lot of success on some of the evenings, uh, just doing the sparkling water. Um, but two things that I, i I really learned about myself and, and what I noticed. So as I've discussed before, I'm extremely, extremely introverted and I have a hard time conversing and relaxing around small groups of people, especially ones that I, I don't know well, and I need to create meaningful conversations with, but I, I, um, they just don't come naturally. So I have, I find that wine helps with, with that, not a bottle, uh, not a half a bottle, just simply a glass. Um, so I, I'm only saying that because it's just been really fascinating for be for me to be aware of. And it's and being aware is one of the very first steps. And that has been good on my journey just to make have to connect that awareness. I don't think I really recognized that I was doing that um with a, with small groups of people or large, um, that that was something that I just it was like a go-to to just be like, okay, I can I become more conversational. Is it because the wine physically re relaxes you or because you've endowed the wine with a, um, uh, with meaning that you are more comfortable with? No, I think it's, it, it relaxes me, but it makes me chatty. Oh, and I literally yeah. have trouble. I mean, I will just sit there like stone face. It, it, it's, I get kind of a clamped and I just, I, I, then I start imagining that I, where I would rather be and how I can leave early. And it's like this whole thing that starts to unfold and, you know, any, 
intense or extreme introvert knows what I'm talking about. So it, it helps me to just relax there in the chair. Like this is where you're going to be for the next hour and a half. So just deal with it. And it, um, it, it definitely triggers something in my brain to, it makes me more chatty. And okay. you've, you've been at some events this past week. So did you, how did you do at those events without wine? Well, I didn't not do it. So these are the two things that I've, I've recognized. The, the other one is just that I really like great wines with meals and some of the meals are somewhat boring without it. So I'm, I'm recognizing that wine to me is almost like it's just like a spice, right? Like you love certain spices on your sweet potato, or uh, I could get super geeky for all the wine lovers out there right now on all my favorites and why, and where I like the grapes from. And, but I'm, 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 I'm pretty geeky kind of sore. So, uh, I it's the food is a little less exciting (laughs) without its pairing, which is why it's a huge industry, right? Like it's, if you can really taste the nuances, which I can. Um, so there's been, there's been some, a couple social times where I have had it and a, uh, time or two, no, I think it's been one where it was like, this is a really incredible meal. And I have this one that I know is going to pair well. And so I did that. So then it's, then you kind of go, okay, that's interesting. Like I was like, okay, I'm just not going to have it for 22 days and see how it goes. But I, I didn't want to be all ruly about myself. Cause I'm not, I don't have a bottle. I don't have too I many. I'm not like in danger of like, I have a glass of wine and then I'm going to have five. No, I have one. And that really is what I do. So I continue to walk down the road um, and say, okay. Uh, and this was a big part of my therapy from my eating disorder was just being present recognizing when I'm feeling like I quote need it right or not. Uh, and when I am choosing to, because it's an enjoyable, um, setting around really delicious food that I'm curious to see what is certain. And then, and then when those two things weren't happening, I was like, meh, sip sparkling water's fine. So now it's time to kind of dive into the first one, right? Like how can I be, comfortable and calm and not panicky in social settings without the glass of wine that makes me chatty, which is just a, it's just more, I I just, I feel more comfortable when I can be chatty because that's what everyone's doing is talking. (laughs) Uh, So I feel like a fish out of water. I feel uncomfortable. I feel unwanted. I feel um, like I, I don't belong. So it's, that's, you know, it, 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 now my job is to kind of dive into that. To, you, to start working on your chatty skills, even, even if you, uh, that's yeah. not your first instinct. Cause you, it's just a habit for you to, right. that you haven't yet explored. So, uh, you yeah. haven't, you mm-hmm. haven't brought that side out of you because we all know how articulate and smart and engaging you are. Um, so something is stopping that at those events. It's not like you. Yeah. Not- and I'm not drinking wine for a podcast. So I pull these off. <laughs> um, but I, but I am very, I'm very drained after them. Like the, the, the podcast, as you know, I have a really, really difficult time doing two in a day. Mm-hmm. Like I just almost, it's like too, it's just too much. So I, 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 I will say have, I haven't decided to drink wine during the second one. If we do have two in a day, you should be proud of that. Cause that would help. <laughs> I know that that would help. It's been a really cool journey in just being extraordinarily aware of what I'm doing, why I'm choosing things, which can really apply to anything, right? Like why I'm choosing to do this right now. Does this feel better physically and physically and emotionally? I feel the exact same. So I I didn't ever, I wasn't feeling better the next day or the if I would have sparkling water versus wine. And that tells me, okay, I'm not, I guess I'm not drinking enough wine to feel shitty the next day. So that was interesting. I was like super aware of like, Hey, maybe I'll feel better. Maybe I'll be clear. Nope. Same. So, (laughs) but wait, you um, said, I remember you said that you were feeling a little groggy in the mornings and a little less patient. Yeah. So and that's just me, I guess, because feel the same with the sparkling <laughs> water. you can't blame it on the wine. Oh, well, but no. that's like, you know, but I can blame other things, you know? I mean, <laughs> so, so it's, it's kind of, I, I do, it, it's, it's still, it, it's still in the, in the journey of like, just, 
I've loved being hyper aware of Mm -hmm. when I want it. And there's been times when I have that I'm like, no, you're not going to, you're going to have tangerine LaCroix. And then I just do it. And then I don't think about it anymore. Mm. Okay. So what, you know, what is that? And is, is it, is it okay if sometimes I want to try it with certain food? I'm going to say for that a hundred percent. Yes. Cause it's really fun and I'm not over drinking, but is it okay to use it to be more comfortable and chatty that I need to, to, to sit with more and work on more and really be in. Um, because I, 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 you know, there's probably some differing thoughts on that in psychology. It's an opportunity yeah. for you to grow, uh, in social situations and just yeah. be, be, um, I don't think it's a bad thing to use wine if you, it makes you more comfortable in parties, but why not also just experiment and see if you can be comfortable at parties without it. So you're not dependent on it. It just is sort of. Yes, I, I did do that. Just so, so, you know, I've done both. I mean, I didn't, it, it, and, and it, it's not, it's not, I don't have fun and I am miserable <laughs> and will. I want to go to the no, car. <laughs> it takes time. It takes time. It takes time. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's dive into you. I want to hear a cholesterol update. Like what oh. did you decide to do? How have you changed? Okay. What, what's going in, what you're eating, how you're addressing this situation. Okay. So for folks who didn't hear that episode where I talked, where I just was bitterly pissed off that my cholesterol came back at total cholesterol 225, LDLs 114. My HDL was good and high. And uh, I think my triglycerides were fine, but an LDL of 114 is way too high. It should be under 70. And um, my total cholesterol should be under, I would like it to be under 150. So, oh, I have, for one thing, I, I started, uh, intermittent fasting, which I thought I could never do that because I don't like to be hungry. Well, it was interesting. I don't eat till noon and um, it hasn't been that difficult. And the nutritionist told me that that was, that was good for uh, lowering the cholesterol. So oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Didn't, I didn't know that about it. Yeah. Otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, <laughs> but actually it's not that hard and I actually enjoy it. Okay. So I'm also, uh, I take, so in the morning I drink, I cut up ginger and put it in hot tea and drink it. And then I eat the ginger, which I don't really like, but ginger is supposed to help lower your, I think it's the LDLs. And then I'm taking red yeast rice. This is just what I'm doing. This isn't advice for everybody. (laughs) Um, And because red yeast rice um, sort of cuts it, it, it stops your CoQ10. I take a CoQ10 supplement with the red yeast rice in the morning. And then I'm eating oat bran with chia seeds and flax. Um, I try and do half a cup a day, usually a quarter cup and then another quarter cup. Um, and I really like it. I add some protein powder in it and and it's good. It's like my breakfast at noon. And then I add AMLA because our guest, Adam Sud, who had high cholesterol, he was our Mm -hmm. guest number two and our guest, he came back later. um, uh, And uh, he recommends AMLA, which is a powder. So I take that once a day. And then in the evening I do the red yeast rice and the CoQ10 again. So that's, that's my regimen have not gone to got, get my cholesterol. Oh, and I'm, I'm trying to lower my fat overall, but not really concentrating hugely on it since I don't eat animal products anyway. And yeah. I'm, and I don't eat fried foods. So it's, um, I, I, I don't really have to, I eat quite a bit of fat, but I'm seeing if I can do it this way first. So when's the test? To see. You do whenever I, you want. I guess, yeah, I thought I'd wait like maybe so that it was two or three months. Yeah. Okay. And All right. so, yeah. So that, that sounds like know. a powerful program you're on. I, I, I think, I think you're going to see a difference. Um, yeah. I hope so. That's incredible. I hope so. All right. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk our, to our very powerful guest today. She is a Woo! knockout. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Can't wait. Awesome. All right. Keep it up, sister. You I will too. too. <laughs> okay. So Dotsie and I owe our guest today a huge thank you, and I'm not even sure that she knows why. But in 2018, Tanya Kay was the MC of the Mercy for Animals panel, where Dotsie and I met because we were both panelists. And if it weren't for that event, this podcast, which now has 180 episodes, would never have been born, and I, for one, would never have met the beautiful force that is Dotsie Bausch. (laughs) So thank you very much, Tanya. And enough about us. Let me introduce our guest because she is a force of her own. 
Tanya Kay learned to tap dance at four years old, and at just six years old, she performed in a local community theater production. At 15, she was cast in her first professional production, The Music Man in Detroit. She's an incredible dancer who toured in many New York shows, including the world famous Stomp, which sold out Madison Square Garden twice. That's 21,000 seats, folks. Tanya is a burlesque show headliner and a danger artist, both which we'll learn about more today. She's also a very busy actress with lead roles in films and with TV appearances on shows we all know like Glee, Criminal Minds, and Jane the Virgin. Tanya's been vegan for almost 29 years and during the pandemic was diagnosed with breast cancer. So we definitely want to explore those parts of her life. Tanya. Welcome to Switch for Good. Dotsie and I are super happy to have you on the show. What an honor to believe that I have something to do with the creation of this podcast. (laughs) Shout out to Mercy for Animals. Shout out to Circle V. Shout out to you two making it happen. This is really cool. Thank you. Thank you for the full circle and bringing me on today. And to Nick Tyler, too, actually, who yes, put Nick. us all three together in the first place and who reached out to you for us today. He's the coolest. <laughs> I love him. He's great. <laughs> so let's start off with, um, yeah, when your teen years, you graduated valedictorian from your high school class in Michigan, but you didn't go to college. So what was pulling you instead? I grew up in a farm town. And I knew that I was meant for the performing arts and entertainment. Uh, Like you said already, I had already been cast in my first professional show at age 15. So I got a taste of the professional stage up in Detroit at the Fisher Theater. And I knew that I wanted to dance. I knew that I wanted to act. I knew that I wanted to sing and, and entertain people and perform but there weren't a lot of role models or examples of that in my small farm town. So I was really confused uh, when I was graduating. And so were my, uh, like the vice principal and our guidance counselor. Nobody wanted me to not go to college. (laughs) And I had scholarships and opportunities like that, but really, in the path of performing arts i felt strongly that i was already working and that i needed to learn how to work in the performing arts not go to a school because i had already been training for so long like a school was just going to take me out of the scene for four years while i got a degree that nobody looks at like when you're in the performing arts nobody says where did you go to college um so (laughs) So I just dove right in. There was a lot of hesitation. I was worried about it because of that farm town scene. Um, You know, maybe people didn't believe that it was possible. Maybe I didn't believe it was possible in some place in me, Uh, but I did it. And I'm glad that I don't work in an office. I've had lots of adventures over the years touring every state in the United States, 18 different countries, making friends everywhere, bringing smiles to people's faces and doing just crazy stuff that I never would have done had I done the traditional path of, I'm a valedictorian and I'm going to go make a lot of money because I'm smart. Um, Instead, I took the risk and I'm an artist. You all are, are the top of the top of athletes in the world uh, per- performing at that and level. And that's from and, an and Olympian that's, who's saying that. So <laughs> I talk about endurance and lactate threshold and all of I mean, I can just, I can just see it uh, unfolding. And so th- for those that have that, have that, have that drive and that grit and that spice, but are maybe being pulled in another direction, like you should do this traditional route from their parents or their whoever's raising them, like what, what do you have for them? There was an argument with our, my guidance counselor in the office of my high school and it was loud. And uh, she said, no valedictorian of this school is going to be a dancer. And that was about enough 
I needed, I need something to rebel against. I'm that type of person. So that was about enough that like did it. But still, I didn't have a path. I didn't live in a big city. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, at the same time, there there was a lot of pressure to have a plan B. Like, are you sure you don't want to go to university so that you have a plan B? And what it came down to, to me, was like, if you have a plan B and you're spending all your time planning plan B, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, how much time does plan A get? And when you don't have a plan B, how much effort does plan A get? Like all of it. So I put all of everything that I had into <laughs> making a living and performing and getting, getting into this career that I had nothing, no education about, um, like it was plan A. So I'd say, you know, for me, the important thing was I didn't have a plan B. It was plan A or nothing. <laughs> I love that. I love it. <laughs> I love, I love so that too. I, you could always, uh, you know, put into place plan B after plan A. But, if, but yeah. what your people were telling you was to have a plan B before plan A. And that does not make sense. Correct. So good for you. And I would say over the years, I have definitely changed and morphed of the things that I'm interested in. My body's changed. My age has changed. You know, different things have happened over the years. Doesn't mean that I always do the same thing as soon as I graduate high school. Um, but it does mean that everything that I've morphed into and done since then is based off the original plan A. Yeah. yeah all right. You're a burlesque dancer, you're a pole dancer, you're an aerial dancer. You, you are a dancer, not just, not just one kind of dancer. You move in all sorts of ways. How has that um, improved or maybe um, made you extremely focused on your body? Uh, again, both are true. So for me, dance has been a blessing in body image and perception. Um, but it also has made me extremely focused on my body because it's my tool, it's my art form. In fact, I just did a photo shoot with a really well-known photographer in Los Angeles. And at the end of it, he says to me, it's wild, you're so comfortable with your body, but the models that I shoot who are extremely thin, you know, and more perfect than me, uh, they don't, they don't feel comfortable with themselves and yeah. you can see it in the photo shoot. And I said to him, my body is my art form. So if I judged it or if I restricted it in any way, I wouldn't be doing my art form. Mm -hmm. I would be holding back my yeah. art. So I think that's the benefit uh, eating disorder wise. Um, also, I'm going to go back to parents that my parents never, it wasn't about how you looked. My mom never had that kind of pressure on me. It was, she was always about being healthy and she worked out. So I had this example of a mom who never talked about how she looked or how, how I looked and she always worked out. So that's what I saw women as doing. Like women work out and they don't think about how they look. <laughs> And um, the wonderful thing is dance is really, you know, it's a fit art form. So you're going to look, no matter what sport you do, you're going to look like the sport you do. You have to build muscles to do that sport. Mm -hmm. So your basketball player, there's a basketball body. Why? Because they play basketball. It's an actual physical thing. So in my life, I have never worked out to look a certain way. I can't even stand it. I can't even stand it. I don't look in the mirror. I don't care. Um, it's just not part of what interests me. Um, but I do fall in love with movements that shape my body certain ways. And that's a benefit because now, you know, I'm becoming mature and I've had a lifetime of athleticism to get me, you know, in this structure, this physique that I have, that I can maintain it much easier than somebody who didn't grow up with a mom who worked out and, or maybe put more pressure on them to look a certain way or friends that did the same thing, some, anything like that. And then 
you know, you're an adult and you're trying to change your physique, it's much harder. I, I mean, I have empathy for people who are trying to become athletic as an adult, but didn't get that kind of support growing up. Um, in dance, there are is a lot of risk for eating disorders, especially ballet. Mm -hmm. And the ballet world is trying to change that. Uh, ballet was never my favorite. So again, I'm very fortunate. Tap dance, it's more expressive. It's more about what you're doing and the sounds you're making. Um, that was my favorite dance form and still is. Uh, but I have trained ballet and I see it, you know, the people who are really serious about that path are at risk. Um, and I have done shows and it's ridiculous. Some shows when I was in my early 20s were weighing us in like we were wrestlers or something. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? You're weighing me in? Don't I look fit? Like I'm a professional dancer. What can I change? <laughs> I, it's yeah. like I have muscles. I'm not I'm mm -hmm. working out all the time. So that was a little weird. Um, but again, I think that my the way I was raised it didn't affect me. Mm -hmm. So they're weighing me in and I'm like, this is bullshit. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if I had been raised differently, they weigh me in and it might have given me a complex. So yeah, mm -hmm. dance has definitely saved me in my opinion, because the way I relate to my body is that of the art form, that it does these amazing magical things and I'm going to look good doing it because that's what dance is. I'm here to make movement beautiful. Um, and I will build muscles to match the movements that I do. I've yeah, never, I've never felt like, but I am focused on my body. So remember that it doesn't mean that I'm not focused on my body in LA, especially when I got out to LA, I've lived in New York. I've worked and lived in Chicago. I got out to LA and the pressure, I could even feel it. You know, the pressure to look a certain way was even higher. So I, I never, I never insulted myself, but before a show, for example, I eat light all day long for multiple reasons. One is because my center is better and I'll dance better. But the other reason is I don't want like gas and bloating by 8 p.m. So I eat light on a show day, but that doesn't mean I have an eating disorder. It just means for yeah. dance, it means I'm taking into consideration that my work is is 8 p.m. Yeah, yeah. Usually. What, what I'm hearing you say is there's just so much purpose behind your body. Yeah. There's so there's so much focus on how and 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 the why behind creating you in your body form in your physical form, and I think it, it, and and Alexandra does such a brilliant job of talking about uh, you know always having a why in her um, in her coaching work, mm -hmm. and when I was training uh, for Olympics a couple years out, one of my teammates had come from sprint track. So think like hundred meters on the running track, right? Huge booty. Like she was like 185 pounds. I had come from the road racing. So think marathon in running, right? So I was much smaller, much more lithe, much skinnier, much smaller build. And we were both training for the same event on the track an endurance event on the track. And so we had this competition to see if we could become like the same similar bodies by Olympic games. So she had 30 pounds to lose. I had almost 20 to gain and coming from anorexia, that was kind of a wild concept, right? Like I am going to gain 20 pounds, but I can't tell you how fun and exciting and empowering it was. I knew all of it had to be in my hamstrings, my hips and my glutes because of our standing start. And I was on a mission, but because there was a purpose, we were going for gold. There was a whole purpose behind it. And it was, it just, it was, it made it like magically fun. I mean, it, 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 it sounds, that sounds like, okay, gaining weight. Okay. Easy there. That's a little much. No, it was that cool to, 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 to try to, to, to get there to get had pretty similar size booties by the Olympics on the podium. It's kind of, it was kind of cool, but whatever your purpose is, let's say you're a mom that just had a baby you know, three months ago, the purpose, if you don't like exercise that much is moving, moving so that your, your kid sees that 
that's a, a, a pillar to health, right? So that you teach your children that movement is, is important in whatever shape and form. So you don't have to, my point is, you don't have to be a Tonya to have a purpose behind moving your body in the whatever way you like to move your body. So I just went on, but I just loved what you were saying. I could just feel the heartbeat of your purpose coming through as you were saying that. And, and that's I, it right there. I agree with you. If you fall, if a person falls in love with a movement, that could be a basketball movement, a volleyball movement, a pickleball movement, a running movement, a dancing movement. If you yeah. fall in love with the movement, you never have to work out a day in your life. Yeah. <laughs> Very well yeah. said. Yeah. 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 And you know, if you're a professional dancer, like I can just go dance in my garage if I like it. Oh, yes. Yeah. And there's yeah. so many adult dance classes like in any city that are like some, the fun stuff, you know, like samba or uh, salsa, capoeira. Yeah. There's so many dance forms that are non-traditional, not like you're going to do jazz and train ballet and, and do your hip hop and tap, like more than that. And adult dance classes are totally out there. Combine it with aerobics, do Zumba, something like that. Yeah. Just figure out oh, yoga. I'm a huge yoga person. I love hot yoga. Yeah. So I fall in love with the movement and I do it. <laughs> I like it. Can we talk a little bit about your dancing before we move on to, to, to the more serious aspects in terms of veganism and, and your breast cancer diagnosis? Because I, reading about, about your um, experience, your skills, I was just so impressed because not only are you a tap dancer uh, and a burlesque dancer, like I mentioned in, in the intro, but you also know how to walk on stilts and are, have been in shows where people move on stilts, te both television stage shows and television shows. You also do fire dancing. And can you tell us a little bit about what I mentioned in the intro, which is not only the kinds of movement that you do, but also your danger art? Yeah, definitely. So I'd say uh, living in Chicago, like my career started in Chicago. Well, arguably it started in Detroit. But the first major city that I moved to with lots of work was Chicago and then New York, then Los Angeles with a lot of touring in there. And each city taught me something different. And Chicago kind of taught me that artists could be normal people and they could, you know, make work and you could have a dance company or you could do uh, theater and still buy a house and have a family. OK, cool. Then. I moved to New York and I, I learned to make art and make it matter. And naturally, New York is where I discovered I was good at experimental theater. Like in a city that values art as mattering, experimental theater is flourishing. So that's where I got into Stomp. That's where I got into De La Guarda, which is this aerial show, like super aggressive. Don't think Cirque du Soleil, like super aggro aerial show. And that's also where I started opening those are experimental theater i started opening my mind to doing different movements like fire that's when i picked up poi and fire poi and the flow arts i picked up flagging i got in a flag dance class um i mean dance company there we combined flagging with modern dance and uh, so so tell us what flagging i've seen it i've seen the videos of you flagging but for people who are listening or watching this uh, Tell them what flagging is and what what your poi. Mm -hmm. poi. Um, flagging is a flow art. Flow arts encompass anything that kind of goes in circles, I'm going to say. So okay. poi spinning and fire poi. So poi is, um, I'd say, Polynesian in descent. There, it's arguable because there's a lot of cultures that have spun things. Um, but Polynesia has... Polynesian dancers have the fire. So we clearly know that there is some relationship to it in its history. And it's about spinning something. Uh, poi is also a food, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a root. But um, spinning, it's a flow art. If it spins, poi could be my first poi I built out of baseballs and an eye screw with chains really bad idea <laughs> because if you hit yourself on the head i woke up on the ground clocked <laughs> like i woke up on the ground i was learning to spin and i totally clocked myself out 
Um, so start with newspaper instead of a <laughs> baseball. Um, but anything you're spinning is a flow art. And then fire dancers will often get juggling wick as the center of the thing that they can spin. So you dip that in various uh, chemicals that light on fire and it makes beautiful shapes around you. And you can tell a story through the shapes. Uh, flagging is also a flow art because it is in circles. It's figure eights, it's circles and you flow. It's kind of a trance thing that you can do or you can do choreography. Flagging's cool. Um, it's history goes back to the gay community in the 70s. Um, super, these flags will be bright colors and big or little and just flagging and celebrating and expressing your sexuality and your orientation. Um, it still is, it's still big in the flag, uh, in the gay community. So shout out to all my fr brothers and sisters who flag. And uh, yeah, the flow arts can also encompass, I also um, do bull whips and bull whips can be considered a flow art, especially the way I do them because it's a constant movement instead of just cracking or, or spot cracking like a martial arts, like target cracking. You can also just make beautiful movements and crack and well, yeah. I hear that you can uh, you can knock a cigarette out of somebody's mouth. With I can do voice. that. Yes, I do target <laughs> stuff. It's fun. I love the. I love whips. I learned a whole bunch of other danger arts, which I call danger arts. Um, danger arts. When I got to Los Angeles, and I met a knife thrower named Jack Dagger, and he and I would rehearse out at mm, I don't know what it's called, Rancho Park. It's in Century City, and there's a golf course there, and there's like this little open area next to the archery range, and we'd take all of our tools out there and just gather the weirdos of Los Angeles and show each other what we have to to teach and to learn. Oh. So people brought, you know, contact juggling or staffs. Um, I learned staffs. I, that's where I learned to knife throw. That's where I learned bull whips. So somebody put a bull whip in my hand and I tried it out. And that was one I said, this is fun. The bull whip <laughs> is mine. Since I've done a lot of bull whip work and I do still today. Um, yes, I still danced in, uh, for a long time in a company, a Trey Knight Stilt World, and that's in Los Angeles. And stilt dance, it's not like just pegging around on drywall stilts or peg stilts and entertaining in costume. This, the dance aspect was super real. So it's more like ice skating because you have to cut to get your circles. You have to cut and move in, uh, be off balance to do turns where if you're just pegging around, you're pretty much vertical and not going off balance. You don't want to go off balance. So stilts has, has been fun. That one I've since retired from because I am a mature dancer now and my knees hurt. So um, that one, <laughs> that one's hard on your knees and hips and back. Um, but yeah, so I've retired the stilts, but I still do Grinder Girl. That's um, kind of crazy. I joined a freak show in this experimental theater world and who freaks after the show the what do freaks do after the show they get together they drink and they dare each other they don't just like give each other new props or new tools to play with they like dare each other to do something ridiculous so we had a dare with a grinder and see well we have some sheet metal let's see what we can do with the grinder and i loved it and it was just like plugged into the wall at that point it was not an act but at this point, it's one of my signature acts. I combine it with my burlesque, and it's one of like the you acts. throw like a meat grinder around. <laughs> it's a grinder. It's an electric grinder. Okay. This one's cordless. The one I use these days, I've upgraded. <laughs> and you grind sparks off of, and in my case, a metal bikini cod piece. So it's like sparks are flying out of a hot box, if you will, and. Uh, it's cool, but I've also done 
done it off of metal corsets or wow. you know props that were specifically set up so that I could grind off of them and not ruin because you're grinding metal so you know people use this in construction and <laughs> <laughs> folks you can, if you if you google grinder girl yeah. Tanya K or you will <laughs> find it. a video of her doing this and it's awesome sparks flying everywhere yes um, yes yeah, yeah. Signature so. act. People want to see it now. <laughs> it's like Carol Channing with Hello Dolly. I watched this uh, this documentary on Carol Channing, and they asked her. They said, "Do you ever get tired of singing Hello Dolly?" Right. And she was so pure. She said, "No. It's an honor that I would have affected people that much that they want to see it over and over again." <laughs> and that's how I feel about Grinder Girl. <laughs> it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got it. Everyone's got to go watch uh, Tanya with Grinder, yeah. her Grinder Girl act. It's, it's fantastic. We could talk about your dance forever because you have had such an, a, a, a successful career uh, with that and with your acting. But let's move on to, to your veganism since the audience wants to know about how your veganism came about and how it helped your dancing and this amazing career yeah well i went vegetarian quite young um my grandparents owned a slaughterhouse and so i got to see firsthand um what happens in a slaughterhouse they owned a family slaughterhouse not a commercial one small farm town so i know that different things happen in other slaughterhouses but um the one that i grew up in and hanging out in and helping out in um was run by my family my grandparents and i remember a day um when i was of a certain age young that they would take me back to the holding cages where i could pet the noses of the animals mm -hmm. but to get there you had to walk through the i'm get, this is graphic but the part where they've cut off the heads of the animals and they're hanging upside down draining the blood mm -hmm. and it wasn't until a certain age like i had done that before as a child but i didn't make the connection and it was this moment where i was like that is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I just didn't feel good anymore. So I didn't make a decision. I was so young. I didn't make a decision to go vegetarian. My mom told me at the dinner table, she said, do you know what a vegetarian is, Tanya? <laughs> and she said, people who don't eat meat. And she was basically telling me that I'm a vegetarian because I won't eat meat. And, and I do remember that, that I would feel sick uh, to my stomach mm -hmm. if I saw meat. So that's, it was very natural. And I think it's very natural for a lot of young people if they're not persuaded otherwise to not want to eat dead animals. But yeah, I was um, vegetarian f for like 10 years. And then I'm on tour with Kenny Rogers and I'm, I'm a teenager still. I'm on tour with Kenny Rogers and I had insomnia. That's something I've struggled with over, over my whole life. And it was just me and the bus driver sitting up. I was sitting up front with the bus driver. Everybody else is asleep in the bus. And we got to a truck stop. He had to refuel. It was just me and him. I went in, I was like, I'm hungry. I'm going to buy something. And I don't know, it's like that commercial where they put on the glasses and you see everything differently. I walked into that truck stop. I was hungry. All I wanted was something to eat and the glasses were on. And all I saw was plastic packaging with neon colors on the outside. And I was angry. I was probably so tired. I just wanted some good food. But all I saw was junk. Like I didn't even consider it food. So what inspired me to go vegan at that moment was actually my outrage with the system um and i saw with those glasses that this this plastic packaging needs to be neon because it requires advertisement to get me to eat it oh. like fruits and vegetables don't require anyone to advertise them they're good for you <laughs> you know it as soon as you eat it like you don't need a billboard telling you to eat a fruit or a vegetable so I was outraged at the system and I saw that this, they were pushing, like I felt 
I was being pushed on by things that make me sick or control my mind. So uh, not in a conspiracy theory way, but a quite legitimate way where I, I feel a certain way when I eat crap. And all that was in that store was crap. And I didn't want anyone to control my mind, my ability to feel healthy, my ability to, um, to my mental health was definitely wrapped up in my decision to go vegan. Um, but it was really a rebellion again against the system. I was like, I'm not part of this anymore. A few years after going vegan, I, well, I skipped something. I'm, I was diagnosed as manic depressive in my early teens. And, um, so I was having a hard time, insomnia, manic depression, just moods all over the place. And I wanted to get off the drugs. And that's when I went raw vegan. So raw vegan was a love for plants and nature and environmentalism, but also a love for myself, my mental health. I wanted to see what my baseline was. I thought, oh, this is gonna be the healthiest diet I've never been off drugs. I'm gonna go off the drugs and I'm going to see what my baseline is. How crazy am I without, without drugs and without foods that could affect my mental state? And this really cool thing happened. Um, I ate raw vegan. It only took about six months before I started just not having a problem anymore with my mental health. It doesn't mean that I'm not moody. I'm still moody. I still have triggers that'll give me anxiety and that'll lead to insomnia. But the good news is that I don't, I didn't need to be on drugs. And what is it that the drugs did from a chemical perspective that was then exchanged out with raw whole foods? I don't, personally think of the raw whole foods as a medicine. I don't think it replaced the drug. Okay. I think it stopped complicating my life. So the drug maybe was necessary or unnecessary when I was still eating stuff that triggered me, um, that just complicated what was going on inside me. Oh. So caffeine for me or, or um, chocolate <laughs> or, uh, wheat or I was still vegan at that point. So it wasn't dairy and meat, but taking just processed foods out, uh, anybody's going to run much better. I think it's just cleans you up. And it took about six months for me to clean up. Also, I had to do a lot of changing my entire concept of what bipolar was and mental health was. Um, I, was speaking at some vegan conferences and I was doing a speaking tour and I told a woman there, she was running a booth and I said, I confessed that I had a manic depression diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Back then they called it manic depression. Now they call it bipolar. Um, and she responded so differently to me that it changed the way I, it changed my, all of my options after that. She goes, she looks at me with beautiful eyes and just admiration in those eyes and said, you must be so creative. That was the first thing she said after I said I, I had a manic depression uh, oh, diagnosis. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wait a second, I am. I am so creative. And then I gave, had self-respect. I was like, hey, wait, the thing that I am isn't manic depressive. The thing I am is somebody who is really cool and I'm really creative and I'm super athletic and manic depression might be a part of that. Wait a second, what is manic depression? Then I did a revamp on everything I believed about it. I was like, it's just a set of symptoms. It's not who I am. It's not a label I'll use. I'm not manic depressive. I have a set of symptoms that match other people and they call this yeah. manic depression. And, and these are just symptoms. How can I relate to these symptoms differently? Well, one of the symptoms is I feel great today and very creative. Let's go with that. <laughs>
and and downplaying the other symptoms, finding out what the trigger is that gives you anxiety or gets you amped up and how do you handle that differently? And as you mature, of course, that gets easier and easier, especially if you're one of those people that do work on yourself and you care. But I, I took it away. I took the meaning behind manic depression away to heal from that diagnosis. And also I, I changed the way um, I felt about drugs because they give you a template for what it means to take these drugs, right? And I was in support groups and I said, I'm going off drugs. And they all said, no, don't go off the drugs. And I was seeing a psychologist and the psychologist said that the suicide risk is too high for manic depressives. I won't see you if you're not medicated. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. And then my, my boyfriend at the time, now an ex, said, I will break up with you if you go off your drugs. And that was about enough. I'm a rebel. That was about enough. <laughs> <laughs> she went off her drugs. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. drugs. <laughs> I, I said goodbye to them. And I had to make like a new meaning behind it. So they said, they, with a capital T, said right. that you will relapse if you go off your drugs. And I said to myself, I changed that meaning and I said, it's withdrawal. So every time I had a hard time while I was going off the drugs and I went raw at the same time to give good support, um, I said, this is not me relapsing. This is not the end point of this moment in time is not me going back down that horrible rabbit hole that it's withdrawal. So I feel crappy because these drugs are getting out of my system. I feel crappy because all the bad processed foods getting out of my system. And I just have to work through withdrawal to see that the light at the end of the tunnel. And that helped me, you know, whatever you do with healing, you have to believe it's going to work. So if you don't believe it, don't do it. If you do believe it, then mm -hmm. it could work no matter what it is, whether it's chemo, if you believe in your chemo for your cancer, if you believe that's going to work, I believe that it can. I mm -hmm. absolutely can. And if you believe that the, the other thing can work, the alternative methods, the, the natural methods can work, I, they too can work. Everything's set up to, to heal you. You just um, got to go with what you believe in. <laughs> and a lot of creatives are a lot. There are a lot of life and spirit and light and that could often in our society be labeled as manic depressive or bipolar, yeah. as you said. Or mentally ill. Mentally ill. How, how yeah. are you today? Do you feel like you're just um, emotional? You get down and you get happy. And you, it, as long as you take care of your body and your spirit and by feeding it positive food, et cetera, that you're okay and relationships, feed it positive relationships, feed it, feed it clean air, feed it clean water, and know when to ask for help too, and know who to ask for help from, because not everybody is the person to ask. Yeah. And you can be mad about that and you can feel let down by that, but you're doing yourself a disservice by asking that person again. If you ask them once, twice, and they don't respond in a way that's helpful to you, find the other person. There's a person that can help you. And that's been good for me. My communication has really changed the way I relate to my mental health. Um, and I don't use the word mental illness. There is no illness. It's health. I do like my emotions. That's why I wanted to get off of the drugs because I had less emotions. Mm. Um, and I celebrate those emotions. I know Alexandra and I really want to, to, to dive into um, the, the shocking reality, what must have felt shocking, or it feels shocking, uh, to receive a, a cancer diagnosis, uh, and the ridiculousness that we perpetuate seemingly in this movement, a fair amount that if you eat vegan, you're, you're good. Like, Nothing will ever touch you that is, you know, uh, scary or dangerous or any kind of illness ever again. And it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it's insanity. It's, it's just not the case and just not true. Um, will you take us through uh, just the, the beginning of that journey uh, when, when you found out and, and speaking about 
your, your, your life and, and all the layers of it and how you fought through working through, um, the, ch- the mental challenges, uh, that have all become a blessing. It feels like to me, the way that you've turned them, uh, into that. But, um, when you found that out, what did you think? And what was some first actions? Were you pissed? Yeah. Everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got diagnosed two weeks after the lockdown for the pandemic in Los Angeles. So the entire Oof. world was quarantined, like the hard part of quarantine, the part where you don't go to the grocery store even. That was that's how early it was. They also um, shut down medical yeah. uh, care for cancer patients. So I got a diagnosis and for the first three months, never saw a single doctor in person. So all the doctors that were telling me what they would amputate and cut off of my body had never seen my body. And I felt very much like I was a number. I was uh, livestock going through the medical system. Uh, It hurt. Initially, I mean, it was tragic because I've had doctors tell me you'll never get cancer because they know of my long-term vegan lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And they said, there's nothing there. Um, But there are more things than just your diet that cause illness. And uh, there are infinite things that cause illness. And do I think that my, at this point, do I think that my vegan lifestyle failed me? Absolutely not. I think it could be much worse. I think it could be much, much worse. if I hadn't lived the way I had lived for so long beforehand. <clears throat> but initially I did, I'm going to admit it. The raw vegan part of me is a spiritual part of me and I love plants and it is, it is my spirit. Um, health and natural health is like my divinity and it's what I devote myself to. So getting this diagnosis really gave me a spiritual issue (laughs) that I had to explore. Um, I definitely felt like I was cast aside by my own deity, that I wasn't good enough, that I hadn't done well enough. And then after going through those emotions, I questioned the deity totally. I was like, does it even matter? Does any of it even matter? Does the environment, the the health, the the plants, the air, the water, the animals, do do we, does it even matter? Do we even matter? I mean, whoo, I'd say uh, mentally, the diagnosis was, it was the hardest on me mentally and spiritually, for sure. Everybody's different. Everybody's very different. Um, It was also a difficult time to get a diagnosis when nobody would see you. But in retrospect, I do thank thank the lucky stars for the diagnosis at the time I did, because at first it was very confusing. We're all in lockdown, quarantine, nobody was seeing each other, no family members can come visit you. Um, Nobody could accompany me even to a doctor's appointment after they did open doors to cancer patients. Um, nobody could even accompany me for the entire year. So this was me alone doing (laughs) everything. And at home, I have my husband, Teddy, and he's awesome. Um, so thank goodness for that. But as soon as I made my choices, it is a solo expedition here. I thank the lucky stars that I got the diagnosis now when nobody could see me because that gave me time. And there's a lot of rush in the standard medical system, especially, and in society uh, to do the thing quickly, to cut off the boobs entirely, to radiate them, to take the drugs, to do the hormone therapy, to do the chemo, do it fast, do it immediately. And I respect that but it's a pressure on people that I didn't need. I was already pressured enough. I had so much to think about. Thank goodness I couldn't see anybody in person. So that gave me a lot of time behind my computer and I did research (laughs) galore. 
on these alternative therapies, I didn't want to, you know, have surgery. I didn't want to, nobody wants to, nobody does. Nobody wants to go into early menopause because they're completely annihilating your ability to create estrogen. Like nobody wants this. Um, and I definitely didn't myself. So I had months of research time to go a little bit nutso and to do all this research. CBI is the clinical trial website. It's become uh, very dear to my heart because that's where the clinical trials are posted. And I know there's a, there's a oh. lot of uh, conspiracy around even clinical trials, but they do get posted there. So if you want science at all, then you will read that and you will learn to speak science language so you can read those reports because it's not like it's not for the laywoman but um yeah i cross-referenced everything i started on natural therapies i found an integrative doctor the whole thing has been a path um towards trying to discover what i felt comfortable with society is uh also on, you know, standard society, like 90% of society is goes to doctors and expects the doctors to tell them how to take care of their bodies. And that's fine. Um, that's the way it's set up. But I've never been that person. So society was also just even survivors of breast cancer. There was a lot of pressure to do it and do it fast and do it aggressive. Um, and I would be told things that are very damaging, like you are killing yourself if you don't do this. I heard that so many times. And to a person who's trying to do something different and trying to take care of their body the way they believe that they can heal, that's really not the thing you should be saying to somebody with cancer. It's scary enough. Like, it's scary just to hear that word. Um, so what kind, of a, what kind of alternative therapies do you feel helped you? You know, I'm going to say that the alternative therapy, it's not cut and dry, and I don't want it to be. Um, it's hard to discover the alternative therapies. It wasn't until mm, 2018, my year might be off, but it's around 2017, that Trump did something good, and um, he signed into law the Right to Try Act. So prior to that, it was actually illegal for a terminally ill, a person diagnosed with a terminal uh, illness to try anything that wasn't standard, that insurance didn't cover. That when you say illegal, it meant that insurance wouldn't cover it or you weren't, yes, you weren't and be allowed to participate in that? A doctor couldn't? They, the way they would enforce it is through the doctors administering oh. the alternative therapies. So they would shut down clinics. They would literally throw doctors in jail. So it wasn't so much about the patient, but the signing that law saying that patients can pursue it made it so that doctors can also administer it without fearing right. Right their license to practice mm -hmm. medicine and without fearing to go to jail or lose all their income or whatever. So that's pretty cool. So we're just on the new edge of being legal to pursue these things. And that's also why it's very difficult to find out about them. Even in Los Angeles area, Southern California, like super progressive health community, um, and I can find them. There's not a lot of it. It's not easy to find. There's not a lot of centers. It's a little disorganized. Mm. Uh, and so I'd say just like a spiritual journey, the alternative medicine journey is about the journey. So everything has helped me. Everything, every bit of research I've done, just the path of seeking, it has been helpful. That is the journey. The seeking is the journey for me. Um, initially I did some, they call it the Greek test. It's RGCC. This is where they test your cancer cells, your specific circulating tumor cells against all these alternative therapies in a Petri dish. So, you know, it's not in your body yet, but they do test. And I found out some things. That was the first thing I did okay. and it's expensive because insurance doesn't cover it still. Um, but I found out what natural elements or more natural elements 
have a high kill rate for, on my cancer cells. And I started clinically dosing with those. Well, what were they? Oh gosh. I mean, some of the, uh, the list, the supplement list is incredible even today yeah. that I'm doing. Um, and I've shifted away from this, but I was doing clinical doses of uh, pawpaw, Woo -hoo! Uh, apricot seeds, B17, um, epigenin, which is found in celery. I was juicing every morning, doing celery juice. And I still do. Uh, and take epigenin pills, mushrooms, the reishi, mm -hmm. uh, mushrooms specifically, turkey tail. Melatonin tested high for me. That's another alternative therapy that some people might want to look into. I'm still on clinical doses of melatonin today. Uh, what else? Curcumin, vitamin C. So I started doing vitamin C, IVs. Um, I feel those were super helpful. Um, in the first year, I shrunk the cancer. And with the type of cancer that I have is hard to image. So, mm. um, so you do these MRIs with contrast. The contract is a toxin. It's a, a mm -hmm. radioactive metal. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us what exactly you were diagnosed with? What, what is the yes. invasive you. lobular cancer? Okay. It's uh, not ductal. Ductal is way more common. Lobular is invasive uh, yeah. and it's hard to image. This specific type of cancer is hard to image. So when they do the MRIs and they use the contrast, they're looking for this white fluid and that didn't may denote cancerous activity even though it doesn't show a tumor hmm. so i had innumerable tumors upon diagnosis in one breast it looked like there was no lymph node involvement but standard medicine wouldn't say if there was or wasn't because they expected me to get a mastectomy and take the lymph nodes and biopsy them to tell me specifically was there lymph node involvement um, we did not do that uh, so they can't biopsy your lymph nodes while they're in your body. I mean, to I maybe I don't no. know. Okay. Maybe they could. <clears throat> we did do biopsies. Mm -hmm. You know, we did biopsy the tumors, mm -hmm. um, some of the tumors, like three, mm -hmm. and there were innumerable tumors. And you get your grade. You find out if you have um, a BRCA genetic disposition variant. Um, you find out some things from those biopsies before you do a surgery. Uh, yeah, that was, that sucked. Biopsies suck. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I effectively shrunk the cancer over the first year. And the cancerous activity, the white stuff, uh, reduced by 80%. So it was a totally different scan a year later. And that's when I became a candidate for cryoablation. And cryoablation, I mean, I'm still a risky candidate. I'm aware of this, but cryoablation is a less invasive um, than amputation. It's okay. less invasive and they use it for um, warts or you can freeze your fat uh, or you can freeze uh, uh, prostate cancer. It's legal, it's covered by, by insurance for them, not for breast cancer. Um, you can freeze skin cancer. So cryoablation is used for a lot of things. When it's inside your body, it has to go to a much lower temperature. So it's <laughs> really intense. Uh, they don't put you asleep. Um, you just have local and lidocaine anesthetic. And it takes a long time and you're aware the whole time and it is painful, don't get me wrong but I still have my breasts, the good news is. And we did three cryoablations in these tiny double A boobies of mine <laughs> uh, last year in spring. And that, it, it's intense. Um, and because you don't remove stuff, there is always a risk with cryoablation that you didn't get it all, especially with a hard to image cancer like mine. So we didn't get it all. Um, all the places that were ablated came back cancer-free in December when we did new biopsies. But we biopsied some places that we didn't treat, and they were- It's in December 2021, so just this past one, Yeah, right? Because you'd had a year, okay. Yeah, okay. so we didn't treat certain areas because we couldn't see any cancer there. It's not surgery. It's we're using ultrasound-guided, you know, cryoablation. 
And uh, so we did three more cryoablations in January. And, mm. you know, that's fun. You can't, every time you do one of these, it's less invasive than surgery, but it is still invasive. And every time you do it, oh, the cancer in my body is close to my pecs. And I have a long healing process to get my pecs back to a place where I can do things and it hurts, you know, it still hurts even today. And this is what, I know, April. So it still hurts today, um, not as bad as it did. Yeah. And so cryoablation is an option for some people and it's not covered by insurance, so it's expensive. So, you know. And are you now cancer free, Tanya, or what? What is that's it? kind of a term that Standard uses. Um, the alternative mm -hmm. world doesn't give a bell to ring for cancer people, and I question, you know, even when Standard gives you the cancer bell and declares you cancer free, right. do they know? Like, well, I mean, apparently we've learned from doctors Dotsie and I is that there's cancer cells all the time in your body. It's whether your body fights them and just gets rid of them at the early stages or a lot or yeah. isn't able allows them to, to proliferate. And yeah. Allows it to, yeah. to grow. So, so I would like that cancer free thing, but I'd have to go to standard medicine to get <laughs> cancer free thing. So, um, I'm just, ha when you're doing, pursuing alternative methods, you have to be, you're outside the system. You have to be very okay with a whole different way of looking at things. I am doing, um, instead of doing the clinical dosing based off the RGCC test now, I uh, have shifted that and I'm now seeing a functional doctor trained by Nasha Winters, Dr. Nasha Winters, and she came up with something called the metabolic approach, which I love. It, it's based in epigenetics and nutrigenetics. Mm -hmm. So epigenetics is kind of like going, whoa, we've had this genetic thing wrong the whole time. We always say you are your genetics and we go back to what the genes are saying. And it's not incorrect, but it's it's the environment that causes the environment, meaning stress, meaning food, meaning sleep, meaning mm -hmm. everything, relationships, the environment that causes certain genetic variants to express themselves or not. So we did the functional doctor with a metabolic approach. This is fascinating. They're all about test, assess, and then address. Don't prescribe anything without testing first. You have to know what's going on with the whole person. And these genetic variants is fascinating. So I know what all my genetic variants are and we can work on um, lowering my processing of estrogen by supplementing with supplements like natural supplements. Mm -hmm. It's it's. It seems so, it's so different than clinical supplementation too. Clinical supplementation is like getting five grams of curcumin a day and you have to take time off because your liver's gonna croak if you do that for very long, you know? But so, gentle supplementation can affect your genetic variance expression. And it answered why, like why I can't eat caffeine or drink caffeine, but my lover, can drink like tea every morning and it doesn't affect his sleep. It doesn't make him stomach hurt. It doesn't make his heartbeat weird. Like I get weird heartbeats at these genetic variants tell the story. So that's fascinating. And it's all about tests. So we test my hormones. We test my um, mycotoxins because I lived in a sick building. Um, we test my heavy metals. I do have heavy metal toxicity. So functional medicine deals with you um, with the target being treat cancer, but all the other things are important to treat too, like this heavy metal toxicity and the, the fungal infections. And, you know, yeah, I live a really clean lifestyle and I have for very long. It just goes to show like you are not impervious just because you live this way. If you do anything in the world, 
You're exposing yeah. yourself to cars, you know, just the vapors and and carpets and off gassing off of the things in your house. Even if you live a natural lifestyle, which I do with the products I put on my body or whatnot, that's good. That's a good start. But there's so much more. Even stress will change your your hormonal profile completely. And yeah. that will change what's happening with your genetic expression. So what are you doing to, in terms of your diet to keep you strong so that no more cancer comes back? How did the diet change? How did the diet change is not much. Um, the good news is I was already on like super healthy diet. I, however, did learn that uh, cancer loves sugar. So I don't eat fruit anymore, which is a super drag, super drag. Uh, but I don't. I'm super low glycemic at this point, I'm working on uh, removing all grains. I'm gluten free um, and have been for a while, but I work on removing all grains because they are also processed like sugars. Um, so I'm going low glycemic. I do juice. Uh, the, I always juiced but now I don't include fruit in my juices. It's just that lemon and celery every morning. And uh, I'd say the genetic testing, the epigenetics is a better guide for me yeah. food wise, because I now know that certain things like, and this would be different for everyone. So I can't really say like follow what I did or mm -hmm. maybe you want to get genetic tested i would do it even if you didn't have a cancer diagnosis i would totally do it um did you do 23 and me well you probably did it through your doctor but do you recommend something like 23 and me or going through a doctor how do you 23 and me is not um as comprehensive uh -huh. as what that we did hundreds more variants mm -hmm. with it's called nutrition genome is the test out there and they are super cool because when you get your report back you don't just get what where your variants are because that would be like hieroglyphics to me yeah. i don't know mm -hmm. they also include the nutrigenetics study the science of nutrigenetics so they make recommendations and then you can go to your functional doctor who can interpret that knowing you better like big, the bigger picture of you so some of them say you need to eat fish oil for me and my functional doctor knows that i am not going to eat fish oil <laughs> and uh so there's other options there's always some other way to attack you know to go for that genetic variant mm -hmm. so you know do i drink rooibos tea i mean it's as simple as rooibos or holy basil for my genetic variants those things are doing the good for me. So it's just little things like that and being consistent. Um, my diet really hasn't changed that much. I had it done 10 years ago and I just had it done it maybe, I don't know, a couple months ago. But if anybody would like me to connect them with the person that did it, I'm happy to if they want to email at uh, podcast at Switch for Good. She's a wonderful uh, doctor out of the fabulous uh, Canada where you are uh, living now. But, um, you know, when you, when we emailed a bit uh, via Alexandra, there there was something that was very disturbing to, to read. And um, it was that you felt, um, it, you just felt very judged by the vegan community um, about your cancer diagnosis. Um, and as one of um, our community uh, leaders who so many look up to, and because we, vegans tend to think of ourselves, I, I don't think the outside world does, but um, as maybe those who have done more work on ourselves, like you put it, and are more compassionate, compassionate um, what advice do you have to us to, to, be more, to be kinder? Yeah, it was surprising. It was surprising. And it was difficult, definitely, because you're going through some mental stuff anyway. Yeah. And society, standard society is telling you to do something you don't want to do. Yeah. And then the vegan community, uh, not all and not everybody, but yeah. several people that um, many people, surprisingly, num surprising number of people judged me 
as a vegan and almost like shame, like I was shameful to the community because I got a cancer diagnosis. Um, by the way, like one out of two people get a cancer diagnosis in their lives. One out of two people don't die of cancer. It's not, it's not a death sentence. It doesn't have to be, but one out of two people will get a diagnosis. So you or someone you know at least is going to be touched by this. And so don't think that just because you're vegan, like you're impervious to anything it can really be damaging. Um, I remember when I went raw that all the raw fooders were like, hey, you can't get sunburnt anymore. Just use coconut oil and eat raw food. And I went to Maui and got sunburnt. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then also I thought, I thought I was impervious too. I was like, I'm so healthy. Things are going so great. Nothing can touch me. And I also went to Maui a different time and the locals said, don't go to this beach. We just had a hurricane type thing. And it, all the bacteria is washed up on the shore. You'll get a bacteria infection. I was like, I'm raw. I'm not going to get a bacteria infection. Oh, and I walked on the rocks and I came home with a staph infection that I had to go to the hospital for. So it, I think, A, it's really dangerous. Even during the pandemic, I've seen people, raw fooders, raw vegans, saying that they don't need to vaccinate or care about a virus or wear a mask if you're vegan enough, if you're raw vegan enough. And that's really beautiful. I love that people think that it's that powerful to do. <laughs> and, and it is powerful. It's changed my life, but it's not going to keep you from getting a virus or getting sunburned or getting cancer. It's, you know, it can make your life much better while you experience those things. If you experience those things, I hope that the vegan community can can remember that all of us will be touched by cancer, that we're not failing if, if we get a diagnosis of anything, and that to come through the other side, we need to support each other. And, and it really is more, it's more than just animal rights. Vegan can be more. It is that for me, but it can be more than that. So tell us, how can people find you? Because you have such a rich acting career, dancing career. I know you're you're not doing your burlesque show right now, but you can certainly find, uh, if you Google Tanya um, or find her online, you can see a lot of clips of your amazing work and your dancing. Yeah, uh, you can find me on social media. I'm really available on social media, although I have taken, you know, a little hiatus. I take longer and longer hiatuses, like, ooh, three days off of social media. Ooh, two weeks <laughs> off of social media. And it helps my mental health. Um, I'm so, on a year break, so yeah, come on, girls. Come on, sister. Come to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm available on social media, so Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Tanya K, T O N Y A K A Y. I have a filmmaking and acting website, Tanya K.com, T O N Y A K A Y.com. I also have uh, dance, stunts, and specialty, and burlesque is included on that website. Uh, that's called The Most Dangerous Woman in Hollywood. Dot com. <laughs> and what I'm doing now, I, I do tour with uh, the Lala's. That's a burlesque company. I'm the host and the headliner on that one. I do that, the ending solo. And we tour. The pandemic shut down the performing arts pretty effectively for two years. So we're just getting back into it. But we do have shows coming up. If you follow me on or track me on Bands in Town, Bands in Town town slash dot com slash Tanya K. You'll always know where my appearances are or if I have a film screening coming up. Uh, these are that's the best way to find out what I'm doing because I don't always shout out about it on social media. Uh, but we have shows in Detroit coming up and Springfield, Massachusetts and some Canadian shows coming up. So that's happening with the Lala's. I produced a burlesque and pole dance and classic car show for five years before the pandemic. The pandemic shut it down. Um, and uh, we have had a few performances post pandemic. So just follow me on Bands in Town. You'll know if the show comes back, when the show comes back, or what 
shape it comes back in. The show that I produced prior was called Tanya Kay's Pinup Pole Show. And it's not over, it's just on hiatus to see what the next incarnation is. Uh, an offshoot of that is Dangerous Pinups. And you can go to dangerouspinups.com. It's an NFT collection, non fungible token collection. Yay. And nobody's doing like burlesque or pinup non fungible tokens. So I saw a need in that world. I was like, oh, I, I know this community. So let me help be a part of that. And I'm in all sorts of movies, movies that uh, things I've directed. For example, um, coming up, a music video that I directed for Lyra Star called Moonrise is coming out. That'll be out uh, May 1st ish. And what else do we have out? I have a film that I directed during quarantine called Every Digital Ghost that is available to rent, so you can watch it at home. I also acted the lead in a film called The Journey of Lucy, which won, I won Best Actress in an Indie Film from Cannes World Film Festival for. And that is about a woman dying of cancer during the pandemic. And it's very real, very close to my heart, super serious material. And mm. that is available to rent as well. If you go to uh, dangerarts.com, you can rent both of those and watch them. Okay. Uh, I'm in a Lifetime movie coming up. It'll be released this fall. And I play a cop in that. Cool. I have a lead role <laughs> in a feature film that is uh, going to be released soon. I don't have the exact date. It's called Shadow Vaults. It's kind of a ghost story thriller. Um, there's many more. I, Live at the Porpentine. Nothing like, going on, like I said earlier. Just I mean, nothing to do if you're Tanya. Some stuff, <laughs> some stuff. But compared to before the pandemic, this is like nothing. Is ah. <laughs> well, folks, go to go to tanyak.com, right? Is that how we, we see you? We'll get a list of your acting. That's acting and filmmaking. Yeah. Good. Um, but just follow me on social media. Track me on Bands in Town. Great. Tanya, yeah. thank you so much for coming on our show. We, we really enjoyed talking with you, and we're so glad you're doing so well. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Hey, folks. Okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>